Recording is about to start. Okay, recording is started. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 111, our class on faith. Just, um, we're going to pray, and uh, I'm sure the others will join us online shortly. I'll uh, keep my eyes on the chat. The camera seems to be moving in and out. One minute. Just adjusting the camera. Okay. All right. Let's play and we will start. Oh, no, it's a little too far out. Sorry, let me just get this back. Should be doing this. Okay, maybe a little up. All right, should be okay. Let's pray. We'll get started. Father, we thank you for this morning and thank you for uh, all the students present here in the class, thank you for those who will be joining us online. And we pray, Father, as we spend time in your word, we pray the Holy Spirit will impart these truths to our hearts. And we pray the Holy Spirit will write these on the table of our hearts. And God, may the Holy Spirit help us on how to walk in the truth of your word and how to apply these truths into our everyday life, into our situations, into what we face in life, and uh, even in the days to come, that we will learn, learn to rise up as men and women of faith in God and do great exploits for the kingdom of God. So we welcome the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence just to move upon our hearts and our lives, and even those online and those who will watch the recording later, that God, you will impart to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone, once again. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are, uh, we were in uh, chapter four, Jesus' teaching on faith. I'm just going to go ahead and um, share this, these um, notes, and then we will... Uh, move forward from where we paused last week. Uh, we started talking about what the Lord Jesus taught us concerning faith, right? So I think we might spend the next two hours today just focusing on this chapter. I want to take it a little slow because I want us to really get a very strong grip on what Jesus taught us concerning faith. Right? If you can learn this, uh, you've got almost everything you need to learn in this course on how to exercise faith in God. Now, of course, there's a lot more we're going to talk about to give us a, a good understanding. Uh, but uh, in chapter 4, what Jesus taught us concerning faith is so very important okay um just a quick review uh we mentioned last week that there is truth there is truth and there are facts facts are the actual situations we are facing and facts can always change facts can be changed but truth is eternal truth will not change God's truth is forever established in heaven. It's not going to change. So, through faith, we are able to cause the facts to change and align or come into alignment with the truth of God's word. Right? So, God's word has, God has spoken his word, his word is truth. And by faith, we are able to change the situations, 
change the facts so that the facts come into agreement with God's truth. Okay, so you'll face situations in life, you'll face mountains, giants, those are facts. You're not saying mountain is not there. You're not saying giant is not there. Of course, there's a problem, there's a difficulty, whatever that is. It is there, it's a fact. But that that situation doesn't have to stop you. You and I have the word of God. This is truth. The word of God is truth. So by faith in God and in his word, we can change the facts and cause them to align with the word of God, with the truth. Okay? So the started off by looking at the teaching of Jesus on faith. So Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So if he taught us concerning faith, he's absolutely right. And our faith starts with him. Our faith is perfected by him. Right? So we go to him and learn from him about faith. He is the author and finisher of our faith. So what did Jesus teach about faith? And we are summarizing this in you know, in statements that we could easily remember. Number one, we said last week, Jesus taught us that all things are possible through faith. Through faith in God. Matthew 17, 20. He taught us that everything is possible. He said, nothing will be impossible for you. So you and I have to think in those terms. Nothing is impossible for me. As a person of faith, as a man and as a woman who has faith in God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible. That's how you and I have to think. Okay? Uh, when you see a sick person, you say all things are possible. You know, the doctors may have given up hope, but you say all things are possible. When you see a need, the need may be very big, but what do we say? All things are possible to him who believes because that's what jesus taught us concerning faith okay the second thing we uh, learned last week is that we will receive according to our faith nothing on earth no man no devil can stop you from receiving according to your faith no man no devil can stop you that's the law of faith if you have faith in the word of God, in what God has said, nothing can stop you. Okay? Now, that's another truth we need to be convinced about. And Jesus taught us, he said, according to your faith, it will be, let it be done for you. Or according to your faith, it will be done for you. Matthew 9, 29, he said, according to your faith, let it be for you. Right? That's the law of faith. It will be done. So when we uh, begin to exercise faith in God, we come from this perspective that all things are possible through faith in God and I will receive according to my faith in God. Or you could put it like this, no man, no devil can stop you from receiving according to your faith in God. That's the perspective we are coming from. Okay. You're not coming from a perspective that says, okay, let me give this a try. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. I will help God figure it out. That's not like, that's not the perspective. That's not the kind of faith Jesus taught us. The faith Jesus taught us is what we are reading now in the scriptures. Right? The faith Jesus taught us is, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's the kind of faith Jesus taught us. The kind of faith Jesus taught us is, according to your faith, let it be done for. As you have believed, let it be done for you. That's the kind of faith Jesus taught us. Right? So when we are going to exercise faith in God, that's, that's the position from which we exercise faith in God. That's the way Jesus taught us. Okay? 
Number three, this is where we, we spent some time and then we stopped here last week. So uh, what Jesus taught us is that our will and desire is involved in the exercise of faith. Our, our will and our desire is involved. You see, many times we hear people pray. Lord, if it be thy will, you know, if it be your will, heal this person. If it be your will. Now, you pray like that when you don't know the will of God. But actually, it's our responsibility to first find out the will of God and then pray aligned to the will of God. When it comes to healing, we already know the will of God. The will of God is he forgives all our sins and he heals all our diseases. That's the will of God. That's Psalm 103 verse 3. So the will of God concerning healing is already given to us in the word of God. So God's word is God's will. Very simple. God's word is God's will. Every promise is a revelation of the will of God. Every promise is a revelation of the will of God. Because otherwise he would not have promised. He would not have said, okay, I will do this for you. If he didn't want, if he didn't will for you to have it. So every promise is a revelation of the will of God. The word of God is a revelation of the will of God. And Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of the will of God. Jesus Christ is a perfect revelation of the will of God. So if we want to know the will of God, look at Jesus. So I have a question. Did Jesus ever pray for a sick person saying, Father, if it be thy will, heal him. Otherwise, take him home. Did Jesus pray for any person like that? What do you think, Francis? Did Jesus pray for any person? Chirag, did Jesus pray for any sick person saying, Father, if it be thy will, heal him. Remember? What do you think? Did Jesus pray for any sick person saying, if it be thy will, Father, heal him? Not even, not even once. Not even once. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You can check. Not even once. Did Jesus pray for a sick person saying, Father, if it is your will, heal him. Never prayed like that. To the sick person, he said, be healed. Blind eyes, be open. He never prayed, if it be thy will. Why? Because the will of God is already known. The will of God is already known concerning the sick. What is the will of God? He said, I am Jehovah Rapha. God's will is always aligned to God's nature. God will never will something opposite to his nature. If you know God, if you know his nature, his will is always aligned to his nature. Who is he? He is the healer. What is his will? To heal. Who is he? He is a provider. What is his will? To provide. Are you listening? Why am I emphasizing this? Because many people, and I'm talking about us Christians, we have the wrong position to always say, if it is your will, and then we pray. But look at Jesus. He never prayed like that. The only time he prayed, if it is your will, only once in his whole life that is recorded for us 
is in the garden of Gethsemane when he was about to go to the cross. And that prayer was a prayer of consecration. He said, Lord, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. That means give me a different cup. And you know, I don't want to drink this cup. Let this cup pass with this cup of suffering. If it is your will, let this cup pass. But if there is no other way, not my will, but your will be done. So that's the only time Jesus prayed, if it is your will. That means it's a prayer of surrender to the will of God. He never prayed that way when healing the sick. He never prayed that way when calming the storm. He never prayed that way when multiplying five loaves and fish. So he never prayed that way to heal the sick, to deliver people, to work miracles. Because the will of God is already known. God's will is to heal. God's will is to deliver. God's will is to meet the needs of people. God's will is to work miracles to set people free. So we can exercise our faith in those circumstances and situations. Are you with me? Are, are you with me? You're not sure? You understand? So we can boldly say, the reason I want, to re I want us to really get this is, otherwise we will be doing what others are doing. They're just praying, if it be your will, if it be your will, if it be your will. But that you cannot exercise faith when you don't know the will of God. You cannot exercise faith when you don't know the will of God. So when somebody's really praying, if it be your will, they're not able to exercise faith. They're not exercising faith. It is not a prayer of faith. Because they don't know the will of God. It's a prayer of consecration. It's a prayer of surrender. Lord, if it be your will. It's not a prayer of faith. In the sense, the faith that will bring results. That will bring healing. That will bring deliverance. Because Jesus never prayed like that. Now, therefore, for us to exercise faith, our will and our desire is involved. That means we align our will to the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father for a person to be healed? Our will must be the same thing. I want to see that person healed. Our will must be aligned to the will of God. The will of God is to heal. The will of God is to provide. The will of God is to work a miracle. So our will and our desire, our desire must be, God, I want to see this person well. God, I want to see this person healed. God, I want to see this miracle happen. God, I want to see this need met. Our will and desire must be aligned to the will and the desire of the Father. It's already revealed, but our will must be there. And then we can exercise faith. So in your mind's eye, and we will talk about this a little later, you must see what the will of God, the will of God expressed. You see the person healed. You see the person well. You see the need met. You see the miracle taking place in your mind's eye. Okay? That means you imagine that. This is what God wants for this person. This is what God will do in this situation. Right? And so our will and desire is involved. We see this in scripture. For example, in Matthew 15, when this woman came, Matthew 15, 28, when this woman came to Jesus for her daughter, she did not come and say, Lord, if it be your will, heal my daughter. Otherwise, I guess it's your will for her to suffer like this. She didn't pray like that. She came for her daughter. Even though the disciples would not let her come to Jesus, she still came, made her way. Somehow she made her way. Even though Jesus said, I can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs, she still had one answer. She said, okay, keep the bread, give me the crumbs. The, chill, the dogs eat the crumbs. They'll fall from the table, the master's table. I mean, she's, in other words, she, will, she was not going to take no for an answer. You see her will and her desire. She was not going to take no for an 
answer. No is not an option. Only one choice. Yes. <laughs> Only one choice. And how did Jesus respond to her in Matthew 15, 28? He said, Oh woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Be, let it be to you as you desire. So he was recognizing that this woman had strong desire. She desired. So I must have it. Very stubborn desire, if you want to use that word, in a good sense. And he said, let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed. So when you are going to believe God for certain things, based on his word, of course, and based on what he's spoken to you, you must be absolutely committed to it. Absolutely. You will not take no for an answer. So I remember this was happened a long time ago. Some stories are from long time, some from recent days. But this was back in 1995, 1995. Some of you were not born. Or maybe all of you were not born. I don't know. Uh, 1995. So that was the year Amy and I got married. So that year, we had fixed our wedding date. I was in the US. Amy was, uh, Amy was in Malaysia. And uh, we had fixed, the wedding date was fixed for May 20th. So I had to go to Malaysia. And I planned to go there maybe uh, 10 days before the wedding. So I was in the US. I went to New York uh, where the Malaysian consulate was. I was living close, not too far from there. And I applied for the visa. And uh, I had already booked my ticket. Um, I think I was flying out on a Monday. On a Monday. I was flying out. This is what I remember. This is a long time ago. But I was flying out on a Monday morning. Um, and I applied for the visa the previous week. They said it will take only a few days to get it. So I applied. I'll look. Thursday, I went to collect my passport with the visa. And they said, sorry, some delay has happened. Uh, we are not sure when we can get your passport with the visa. I was so upset. Because there's only one more working day. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they're closed. And Monday, I'm flying. There's no way. I, so I said, no, no, I have to have it. I'm coming back tomorrow to collect my passport with my visa. And he said, sir, I mean, so, you know, it can't happen. You know? I said, no, I'm coming back tomorrow to collect my passport with my visa. I have to have it. And I left. But now, the only thing I could do in that situation was to use my faith. The only thing I could do. Because it was like the yeah, situation. So I just, you know, basically apply Matthew 17, 20. The, the news was not good. You know, I, what, I can't remember all the details of what they told me. But basically, they said it cannot be done. But then I went back to my room. And I began to use my faith. I said, I take authority over the counselor. I take authority over every situation. I command that my passport with the visa be released tomorrow. I will travel. I will fly. Because the ticket is booked. Everything, wedding is already, <laughs> wedding dates already been fixed. Everything is done. I have no choice. So the point is this. When you, when, in real life. And I'll share other stories as well. But in real life, when you are faced with these kinds of things, you need to know that Jesus said, if you have faith, nothing will be impossible. He said it. Second, he said, according to your faith, it will be done. That means no man, no devil can stop it. And third, your will and desire is involved. So if I had backed off and said, oh, maybe God doesn't want me to fly. Maybe God doesn't want me to get married this year. Maybe God, whatever. I could have come up with so many things. No, but my desire and my will was set. I am going to fly. I will travel. Nothing and nobody is going to stop. I will come 
So next Friday, so next day, Friday, I went in the afternoon before the office closed. They had it all ready. Here is. So I got my passport with the visa stamp and I flew. So the same people who told me yesterday, the other day, previous day, cannot be done. Everything was ready. I don't know. I don't bother how they did it or what happened. But all I know is I responded in faith in my room before God. I said, God, it has to be done. And I went to the expectation. I'm collecting my passport with the visa and I'm going to fly. So like that, just simple examples where, you know, your will and desire is, is involved in this, in the exercise of faith. If your will and desire is not set, if it is not firm, if it is not fixed, then it's difficult to exercise faith. It's difficult to exercise faith, right? So we must have a determined desire. Uh, this will happen. I will get it done. And just like this woman, when she came to Jesus, she was not coming to bargain. She was not coming 50-50. She was coming to receive. And that's how you and I must be. Okay? So our will and our desire is involved. And we see several other examples. And I'm, I'm emphasizing, re-emphasizing what I shared yes, last week. I don't want to pass this very quickly. Now, you know, the, the, some people, and I want to address that now, some people may not agree with what I'm saying. There's, oh, God is sovereign. How you can say your will, your desire is in what? But, and they may use these scriptures to argue against what we just said. So one argument will be, I'll put that on on page 30. They might say, well, Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's teaching us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But understand that when you have to, we have to understand this statement in the rest of what Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God. What is He's not teaching us to be pray this prayer passively. That is, you sit down and say, oh God, your will be done. Your, your kingdom come, your will be done. That means in their minds they're saying, whatever happens is God's kingdom, whatever happens is God's will. But that's not the posture. The posture is, God, I want. To see your kingdom, your rule, your dominion established here on earth. And I want your will to be done. That's only that's the only thing I'm going to settle for. Your kingdom and your will. So the posture is not one of a passive. Oh, if it is your will, let your kingdom come or whatever. No, the posture is one of determination. The only thing I want to see here on earth, God, is your kingdom and your will. And I'm here through prayer to enforce it to happen. Now, why do I say this is the right posture? Because Jesus taught us in Matthew 16, he has given the keys of the kingdom to whom? To us. If the keys are in your hands, then who must open the lock? Huh? You have the key, you're standing in front of the lock, and it's like, oh God, open the lock. God will say, Hare, a key in your hand, open. Matthew 16, is 18, 19. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, yeah. I will give you the keys. So that what you bind on earth, what you lose on earth. So who is to bind, who is to lose, or who is to lock and unlock? We. Because we got the keys. 
So the posture when we pray, your kingdom come, has to be understood with the fact that the keys of the kingdom are in our hands. So when, I, when we're praying, God, your kingdom come, he's also saying, very good, you want my kingdom there, but I put my keys in your hands. That means you bind, you lose. To see my kingdom released on the earth. So that means my desire and my will is involved in seeing God's kingdom come and release on the earth. It's not a passive prayer of, oh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No, it is God. I am determined to see only your kingdom and your will established wherever I have influence, wherever I am going to exercise the keys of the kingdom, your kingdom and your will is going to happen. So that's the understanding of Matthew 6.10, when he says, you pray, your will be done, and your, your kingdom come, and your will be done. Secondly, I will address this, and I'll take questions. Okay, I'll address this. I'll give time for questions. The second uh, argument that people might use uh, to disagree with what we have said earlier, that our will and our desire is, in, is involved in the exercise of faith, the second argument that people might use is, oh, Jesus prayed this prayer. Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. They'll use this prayer, oh, Jesus prayed. But then I, we explained earlier, only once in his entire earthly life and ministry, as recorded for us, did Jesus pray this prayer. He did not pray this prayer, you know, when there was a storm in the sea. Oh, Father, if it be thy will, let this storm pass. But nevertheless, not thy will, but my will. If we have to die, it's okay. He didn't pray like that. He rose up and he said, peace be still. And then he asked his disciples, where is your faith? Meaning, you could have done this with your faith. Right? He, never, he never even took time to ask Father, what is your will? He knew, Father's will is for you to live. Father's will is for you to go to the other side. So don't even bother. Just exercise your faith over the situation, over the circumstance. That's the will of God. Right? So Jesus never prayed, if it be thy will, when it came to healing the sick, or feeding the multitudes, or calming the storm, or casting out demons, or even raising the dead. He knew what the father wanted. He did it. When the father gave him a specific word, he did it. Otherwise, he just responded to people in faith based on their covenant with God. Okay? So, God's will is always consistent with God's nature and God's word and God's promises. If you know God's nature, if you know God's word, if you know God's promises, you know the will of God. Because God's will is always consistent with his nature, with his word, with his promises. So you can just move out on that. All right, let me pause here and take any questions. Let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, good morning, everyone, on the classroom. Um, any questions from our online students? You all with me so far? Krisha. Krisha has a question. What if we pray in faith, we are constantly praying for something and expecting it to be answered? But when the time comes, we see a different result. Does this mean we are weak in faith or is it God's will? Okay. So... I'm not sure if I have a clear-cut answer for that, Krisha, because situations would vary. So one is, if we know the will of God before we start, I mean, that, that's usually what we should do, is know the will of God about a matter before we start. And if we know the will of God concerning a matter, then our journey of faith is to press through 
until we see the fullness of that accomplished. And as we will learn a little, little later, sometimes we may see it happen progressively. Right? So you see some of it happen, a little bit more, a little bit more. It's taking time. But our, our, our determination is, I want to see the fullness of what God has promised. I want to see the fullness of that accomplished. And so I would say we need to continue, even if we see a partial fulfillment, you need to continue to press in to see the fullness of that promise fulfilled and expressed. Okay? Now, if we are not very clear about what the will of God is, then we just stay open. We know, in general, this is what God wants us to do. How exactly it would materialize may be different from what we have envisioned. That's okay. As long as the main intent is fulfilled. Right? So, example, you, you know, you're believing God for a house, and maybe you're not very sure what it's going to look like, but you're believing God that he will provide that place for you. And so, you journey through to it. It may not necessarily look as what you imagine, but that promise of God to you to have a home is fulfilled. And so, we, you know, even though how it appears, up, how it has materialized is different from what we imagined. That's okay because what the thing that you were believing God for is fulfilled. So that's how I would respond to it. And I'm speaking in general terms, uh, but you know, from situation to situation, we need to understand what God wants us to do and uh, pursue with Him for that. Okay. So Krishna has a follow up question. Sometimes it is discouraging. If you fail first time, we should try again for the same thing. I would say yes. Even, you know, uh, if you fail once, try again. You know, for instance, I'll just give some examples. Uh, you know, sometimes when people come for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, the first time you pray, nothing happens. And we tell them, don't give up, you know, just come back next time. So we come back again, we pray again. And they may start praying in tongues, or they may start singing in tongues, and so amazing things will happen. Uh, some people, I know, you know, we've prayed for them on three different occasions, and the third occasion that we prayed, they had a powerful experience. And I remember one person, and I do share this particular testimony often, and he he was a chain smoker. Uh, he used to, uh, and, and and you know, he at that time he was in his, I think, early 30s. So he'd been smoking for a long time. And um, uh, he'd, you know, he was, he, he, I don't know how many packs, four or five packs a day he would be smoking. Now, he used to come to church, sit in the back, and go. And he had already come two times to be prayed for the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But, so we said, don't give up. We always tell people, don't give up. Keep coming back. So he came for the third time. God powerfully baptized him the Holy Spirit. Now, his normal routine was every Sunday, come to church, attend service, on the way back home, buy, pack, buy his pack of cigarettes to go and smoke. That day, that Sunday, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. On his way home, he forgot to buy cigarettes. And then after a few days, he told his wife, hey, I haven't had a smoke for three days. I didn't even feel the desire to have it. And now it's more than 10, 15. I would say 12, 13 years now, he's never touched it. So God so powerfully baptized him with the Holy Spirit that even this whole desire that was in his life for many years just went away like that, just gone. So that's just one example where, you know, we keep pressing on till we receive, okay? Um, let me back up, take up a question here from Deepika. Uh, then we try to attain something in faith, but fail multiple times for many years. How do we ensure our faith doesn't become passive over the years of failure? Uh, we're going to learn some things in, uh, later on in this course. One is to go back, keep going back to the same scriptures. Another thing is to keep the picture of God's promise always in your mind. You know, and we will learn about this. You know, think about Abraham. When God called Abraham in Genesis 12, God said, I'm going to make you the father of a big 
nature. Fifteen years had gone. And he had not had a child, he and Sarah. So he's very discouraged, 15 years. That's a long time. And so in Genesis chapter 15, one day he's talking to God. He says, God, you said I'll have a child. No child. What's happening? Having a conversation with God. And then God tells Abraham, Abraham, come outside your tent. Look up in the night sky. And he sees the stars. And God says, so shall your descendants be. So God is giving Abraham a visual picture of the fulfillment of his promise. That's how your descendants are going to be. And so you can imagine Abraham kept that picture in his mind. God said that my descendants would be like the stars in the sky. So that was a fulfillment, a picture of the promise of God. So I'd encourage you to do that, to keep that picture of the fulfillment of God's promise and stay encouraged until uh, we see that uh, outcome. So keep going back to the promises and keep, uh, you know, keep the picture of a fulfillment of God's promise in, in your mind. We'll talk more about that in this course later. Okay, Surya. Uh, repeat the verse regarding heavenly keys. Okay, so that's Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 to 19. You know, Jesus says, uh, who do men say that I am? Peter says, you are, you are the son of the living God. And then, you know, then he repeats the question, repeats the promise, Matthew 16, 17, 18, I think it is. 19? Matthew, thank you. Matthew 16, 19. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions from on Enkla? Son? Go ahead. I'm sorry? Uh, okay. So, Sean has a question. When do we pray, thy will be done? So we pray, thy will be done, when we are praying the prayer of surrender or consecration, right? When we're praying, for example, the prayer of surrender, that means I, I want to go one way. My desire is to go one way. But God is telling me to go another way. That's when I pray, God, not my will. But thy will be done. Prayer of surrender. Similar to that is a prayer of consecration. Consecration means I am willingly dedicating myself for something. To consecrate, dedicate. I'm willingly dedicating. So maybe similarly, my will may be to do something else with my life. But I willingly come and say, Lord, not as I will but your will be done. I'm consecrating myself to do your will. Right? So in a prayer of surrender, a prayer of consecration, we do this. Now, then there will be situations in life when we don't know the will of God. Right? So then we say, Lord, I don't know what the right thing to do is. I don't know what the right thing to pray. So God, whatever you will, let it happen. Or we can ask God, if we want to, we can ask God to reveal his will so that we can then pray according to the will of God. Or we just let it go, especially when somebody else is involved. For example, if there's a sick person, God's will is to heal the sick person. But if the sick person does not want to get healed, then we can't force it. So we say, God, we just release this person into your hands. Because we can't force that. Now, some people don't want to get well. Why? Maybe because they want to die and go, go to heaven. That's much better. Or maybe they're just tired of life, tired of fighting, you know? Or maybe they just can't get themselves to a place to believe that God can heal them. So many reasons why some people are not ready to 
receive prayer for healing. So then we can't force healing on them. So it's a Lord, we just release them. Okay, so those are situations where we do that. Okay. Any questions from class? Anybody else? Great. Can't hear you because of this fan. Just speak a little loudly. Sorry. Healing evangelist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Rin has a question here in class. The question is, God uses healing evangelists to heal people. But sometimes we hear of themselves, them also dying of some sickness, disease, so on and so forth. Why does that happen? Uh, there are several reasons, right, and we can, that we can put forward. One is the anointing of God and the gifts of healings are given to serve others. It's not for self, right? So God releases the healing anointing and the gifts of healing to serve other people. The gifts of the Spirit are given for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man as the Spirit wills. It's given for the common good. It's for the people. It's not for myself. I'm not using the gifts to serve myself. The gifts are to serve people. So the gifts of healings and the anointing will flow to minister to the people. But if I want to receive healing for myself or any one of us, we have to extend our own personal faith in God to receive healing for ourselves. Okay? So that means I need to believe God and his word to receive healing for myself. And, what, and the fact is this, many healing evangelists, and if we aren't careful, we also do the same thing. It's easier to have faith for somebody else than to have faith for yourself. It's easier to pray and minister to somebody else in faith because you're under the anointing, the gifts of the Spirit are flowing. So it's easier to minister to somebody else than to have faith for your own self. Because to have faith for your own self, you have to do all these things we are learning in this course. You got to meditate in the Word of God. You got to. You have to exercise faith for yourself. So that's one reason. Another reason is that we are responsible to take care of our physical bodies. So if I neglect my own body, then while I'm ministering to others, I could wear my own body down. Like example, you find an example of Epaphras in the Bible. Um, who was an associate of the Apostle Paul. He was working alongside Paul, and I think it's in Philippians chapter. Mm, let me try to find the exact verse. For um, Just give me a moment. So uh, uh, Paul writes about, about, um, uh, about Epaphras that he came close to death while he was serving God. Right? And, and so he, you know, he sends him back to, or maybe it's in Colossians. Let me just find the exact verse. Um, can't remember this. So Paul writes about him, and he says, you know, um, um, he, for your sake, uh, if, uh, this is in Colossians 4, verse 12. And... He mentions a power for us, Colossians 4, verse 12. And he also mentions somewhere that um, he, he, he almost came close to death. Philippians 2, 27. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, this is Epaphroditus, another one, another person. So, uh, thank you. That's the right verse. 
Philippians 2, 25 to 27. So Paul mentions another, not Epaphras, but another servant, a fellow worker, Epaphroditus. He says he was sick almost unto death. So you see this man? He was serving God alongside Paul. But he came close to death. Because he was so overworking himself, he was going to die. So Paul, you know, so that's another reason that, you know, we, we have to take care of our own selves while we are doing the ministry. Otherwise, many people just push themselves uh, and they end up that way. And sometimes we just step out of the will of God. That is, if you're not doing God's will, and this has happened in some cases, you step out of the will of God, then that exposes us to attacks of the enemy, of sickness and disease, and then uh, they die. Okay? All right, let's take a break. I will be back in 10 minutes. Um, thank you.